hear me? Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bogenstein. I'm the interim director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life here at UConn. And um, I handed out some flyers for courses that we're offering this semester, so please take one and take a course. Um, I'd also like to uh, mention that uh, this uh, lecture is sponsored by us and by the Departments of Anthropology, uh, the Literature, Scottish and Languages, and the Humanities Institute. So we are <coughs> grateful for their support. Uh, and thank you all for making the trip up here, the hill, uh, to this unusual location. Uh, we knew more people would be coming than we could fit into the original room in all calls. So, uh, this was the only room available, and uh, it's it's beautiful. So we're we're glad that you uh, could come today. Our speaker today is Dr. Karen Stern. Um, she's professor of history at Brooklyn College of uh, CUNY in New York uh, City. I've known her for many years, and it's just such a pleasure to um, have you here at UConn. Uh, professor Stern is the author of numerous publications. Among them, the monographs Inscribing Devotion and Death, Archaeological Evidence for Jewish Populations of North Africa, um, which came out in 2008, and her most recent book, Writing on the Wall, Graffiti and the Forgotten Jews of Antiquity, um, which came out in 2018 with uh, Princeton University Press. She has also been a research fellow at the NEH, the Albright Institute of Archaeological Research in Jerusalem, and the Getty, Getty Villa in Los Angeles. She's conducted field research and excavated throughout the Mediterranean, um, and Petra in Jordan, and Sepphoris in Israel. Our Stuart Miller, our very own archaeologist here, and uh, academic director of the center also, um, did excavations there uh, in ancient uh, Pylos and in the Athenian Agora, which is in Greece, obviously. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Stern. Good level of voice here, sir. You can't. You can't. Yes. No, it's good. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much um, to <laughs> Professor Wolgenstein and um, the entire uh, Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life, but also the other departments, like the Department of Anthropology, for helping uh, me make this trip. I've never been to UConn. It is a beautiful campus. I invite you to my own campus if you want to particularly celebrate the impeccable condition of your campus. <laughs> um, but it's really, um, so it's really a, a treat to be here, both to see old friends and colleagues, but also to see sort of the glory of uh, this campus, which is in a much more um, rural setting than the one um, to which I'm accustomed. I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'm here today primarily to share with you some of my research that led to my recent book. And um, I will say this, a, a long time ago, maybe even, I don't know, four years ago or something like that, um, I was giving a talk in Israel and my husband warned me that throughout the talk people were going to interrupt me. And I said, no, 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 I can't believe that's, that's true. Nobody's going to interrupt me while I'm giving a lecture. And he said, no, they're going to do it. And sure enough, about a sentence in, somebody had their hand up and interrupted me. That is to say, even though I wasn't really accustomed to that dynamic at the time, I actually think it's a really helpful one. So today, some of the terms, even if I try to explain them, some of the terms I might use, you might not know what they are. Um, some of the periods of time I'm talking about, you might not know what they are. <laughs> Instead of just sort of sitting there and having no idea what I'm talking about, please feel free to raise your hand. You don't have to be rude when you interrupt me, but maybe just a little bit. Raise your hand so I can make sure that you guys are getting what I'm talking about, because otherwise it's not going to mean anything to you. So how many of you um, have studied the ancient world at all in any capacity? Okay, it's a pretty good number. Has anybody studied ancient Judaism in any capacity? Okay, a smaller number. That's fine. Has anybody ever seen some graffiti in their lives? Ever. <laughs> that was the first thing I said when we were walking around. I was like, there's no graffiti on this campus. There is a good comparanda, as we call it, in the business. OK, so uh, for those of you who are sort of at the Venn diagram of some of these groups, it might be easier for you. But I'm going to try to make this accessible to all of you. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about this book, Writing on the Wall. Um, which really started
started out in lots of different funny ways, but I'll tell you about one of the ways. Which is that this is the world that I tend to study. This is the, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Is there like a little pointer in the center? Okay. All right. So this is where I spend, my brain spends a lot of time. If I'm not actually doing field work, this is a part of the world I'm thinking about a lot. Um, does that look familiar to any of you? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. So, I spend a lot of time thinking about this part of the world for various reasons because the culture that we inhabit is very much informed by what happened in that part of the world over centuries and millennia. And there's a particular question that I tend to ask because that's sort of what is my business of doing. It's not necessarily what most people think about all the time. Um, and it's about Jews who inhabited this part of the world in antiquity. So why should we care about these people? Some of you might say, I don't, but I'm really happy about the free food, so I'm just going <laughs> to limit it to what sort of is going But if you were to say, why would these people matter? You'd say, perhaps, okay, because Judaism in the ancient world has something to do with what happens in the modern world that relates to Judaism. It certainly relates to what um, develops in earliest Christianity, which develops into later Christianity. And we also, in many ways, can't really understand the origins of Islam either, unless we sort of understand what is happening <coughs> in these parts of the world, which includes this part of the world. So there are ways in which uh, the study of ancient Judaism, <coughs> if you're interested in the modern world, is not as ridiculous as some might imagine. So if you want to know, let's say, about these Jews who inhabited this part of the world, if you're going to sort of buy my argument, and you can challenge me on it later, that the study of these people sort of matters to us or should matter in some particular way, we find ourselves at this sort of crossroads, which is sort of weird. Okay, so if we know that there is some contribution in studying Jews in antiquity, what is the problem when we can't really figure out who they were or where they were because so much information about them is lost? It's lost forever. Which means we know that these people live there for lots of different reasons. We know they certainly did. Um, but how come we don't have information about the vast majority of them? And there are, two, there are a few different reasons for this. Maybe if I can move the slide forward. Okay. We do have robust evidence for Jews through the literary record. Have you guys ever heard of the Mishnah or the Talmud? Some of you have? Four of you? Hey, that wasn't hyperbole. Okay, four. Great. Um, but I'm sure it's a few more of you. So what we definitely have is literary evidence that these people existed. The problem is we have evidence from two particular places, and two particular places only. And there are certain limitations in the types of sources available to study those populations, as well as others who sort of lived around them. Because it also wasn't just Jews who wrote about themselves. There are also other people who wrote about Jews. Christians wrote about Jews eventually. Um, Muslims wrote about Jews. But I'm just going to show you one or two examples of the types of limitations that sometimes we have. And Professor Miller will indicate that this is an oversimplification, but I'm going to oversimplify for the points of what we're talking about here, and you can complexify later if you want. One of the problems is that when we look at rabbinic texts, many of these texts are very inwardly gazing. That is to say, among people who identify themselves as rabbis, who participated in cultures that produced things like the texts of what is called the Mishnah, or sort of the oral law, as it's frequently called, or the Talmud. There are actually two of them, one from Babylon and one from uh, Roman Palestine. Um, those people really thought about themselves quite a lot, to the point that some of the central values of participating in those types of societies where people are thinking about the Torah, or studying scripture, thinking about scripture, it consumes their whole lives. And a lot of these texts really just talk about that, the ways that the best type of life involves constantly thinking about study and participating in study. Other types of evidence that we do have for ancient Jews don't come from Jews themselves, but from pagans and Christians, and also from uh, early Muslim populations. And this is just one of uh, many examples we can bring, which is that often when we look at what we would call texts of, let's say, Greco-Roman pagan populations, and pagan is sort of shorthand for they worship 
maybe one god, maybe lots of gods, maybe they include Zeus or Jupiter or something like that, maybe they don't. Uh, but when we talk about Christians, it's a little bit clearer. A lot of times when people talk about Jews, they're not actually talking about Jews at all. That is to say, here we have in some texts like this one of Augustine, right, that these are not Jews in name, but they become so by their error. In other words, in many early Christian texts, how do you find out about contemporaneous Jews? It's really hard to know because they just say any bad Christian is so bad at being a Christian, you could even call them a Jew as an insult. That doesn't give us a lot of information, does it? It gives us a lot of information about um, what Christians were doing or thinking. This wasn't every Christian, to be sure. It gives us information about that particular vintage, but it doesn't tell us a lot about what Jews were doing in their day-to-day -day lives. So, we look to other places, right? And this is what Professor Miller does, too. We look to archaeological evidence. And the reason why we know, actually, that the literary sources that survive to us are so limited because we actually have archaeological evidence from so many other places. So each yellow dot covers a region from which we have archaeological evidence for Jewish populations. So we know they're actually all over the place, even if they didn't produce texts, which at least in my history department is sort of something that people like to lean quite a lot. But these types of evidence are also limited in other ways. For example, a lot of it relates to burial. I guess you guys probably don't hang out in cemeteries as much as I do. I usually hang out in ancient cemeteries, not in modern ones. But one of the things you tend to see is that we can see evidence of the existence of Jews in the material record, right? Because they wrote down names of people who were deceased. But it doesn't really include that much more information, sometimes other than their name or their parents' name. Sometimes it does. But in the ancient world, sometimes the only time somebody's name would ever be written would be on a tombstone, because that's just the way the world was. So it's very important, especially for the study of names and other things, but it just offers very limited information. The other place we like to go is to the study of the ancient synagogue. There are archaeological remains for ancient synagogues. And most of the remains that we have from the land of Israel, which um, at its time we call Roman or Byzantine Palestine, Many of, let's say, most of the remains come in the form of mosaics, but also architecture and other related things, right? I can make both and architecture things. But often, in these particular cases, we have mosaics that decorate. These are from the floors. Have any of you ever seen these? Have any of you traveled to see them? Okay, so that's what we have. Okay, so these are places you would have walked, right? These are floors. These are heavily decorated. <coughs> and sometimes it tells us a little bit about what happens what people think about, what people visualize in these types of spaces, but it doesn't give us a full picture of what they were doing when they entered them. Ancient synagogues need not be exactly like we imagine modern synagogues to be. So these are sort of decorations from the walls. This is from a very uh, famous synagogue where it's the only known ancient synagogue where we have intact wall decorations, which maybe I'll talk about later. Have any of you seen facsimiles of this pretty nearby at Yale? Yale actually has the best collection of objects from this synagogue and the related town anywhere, anywhere in America, anywhere besides Damascus, actually. Um, but this is sort of limited, too, because when we're talking about, let's say, burial spaces or spaces where people worship, that's not sort of the totality of what people are doing. So what happens is, it's sort of a very long lead-in, but I just sort of want to describe to you why it sort of tends to be really frustrating when you're interested in ancient Jewish populations, that it seems sometimes like we just don't have enough information, even if we want to care about it. So, we have, we know that these populations exist. How do we investigate them in new ways that sort of better illustrate how people were living, even if they're using the spaces of the dead, or even if they're using synagogues, right? Other ways that people are sort of operating in the ancient world. And so my solution, at least in this book, and sort of an associated project, is to look to evidence that still exists, right? Not monumental tombs, not monumental synagogues, but sort of neglected materials. And in here, the answer lies in graffiti. Now, um, I never really knew that these things existed. Most people don't. So if you've never heard about it, and you're a professor, of course, you went to being here, and you have no idea what I'm trying to talk about, you're really not alone. Uh, but what became clear when I started working on the project is that even though I didn't know that Jews produced ancient graffiti, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, I realized that actually they did this all the way around the Mediterranean. 
and most of the same places that we have other types of archaeological evidence for them. Even in Arabia, so not just around the Mediterranean, but in uh, territories that stretch toward Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, and even Iran, South Arabia, many of these examples are even found in Saudi Arabia. So all of a sudden, the shape of the world changes a little bit. But then you can say to me, okay, so there are lots of graffiti. Who cares? They're really scratchy. They're not that attractive. Uh, why bother? Well, I'll try to indicate to you why you could try. Uh, first of all, you might ask, what is a graffito? A graffito is a singular of graffiti. Do you guys know that? It's true. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. It probably does not look a lot like the graffiti that you think of as graffiti, or if you were to see somebody sort of tag a building downtown or wherever that would be downtown. I don't know, maybe a car or something. I feel like there's not a lot of graffiti around here. It's way too clean. Um, so I'm defining graffiti, graffito and graffiti in my own way. And graffiti, the designation of whether something is a graffito or graffiti changes according to context, which might not really be helpful for some of you either. But they're carved or painted words or images that sort of are signs of unofficial use of a space. That is to say, it's not like so-and-so dedicated this building. I'm sure you have signs of that all over campus here, right? It's not like that. But it's a sign that somebody's using a space and leaving their mark. And for the purposes here, I'm talking about graffiti as things that are images as well as text, and carved as well as painted. If you really want to impress your friends at your next dinner party, you can explain to them the difference between a graffito and a dipinto. A dipinto is technically something that's painted. So all things you actually know about graffiti as being graffiti, they're wrong. They're dipinti. Okay, so your whole life has been run in a, a totally inappropriate way. Now you know that anything painted is actually a dipinto. But here I include both for very specific reasons. Now obviously this is what we think of when we think of graffiti, or at least if you visit New York City. This is the intensity of graffiti we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I like it. Other people don't. What have you. Uh, Examples like this. So sometimes it's really hard to get beyond that because that's sort of what we imagine to be graffiti. This is one of my favorite examples, which this winter still existed in Jerusalem. Has anyone, well, if you guys, have any of you been to Jerusalem? Yeah? Have any of you seen this? Bonus <clears throat> points. This, if anybody knows where Kikar Paris is, this is very close to the Prime Minister's residence. And a little anecdote that I will give you before I'll even launch into the graffiti that I'm supposed to be talking to you about to begin with is that when I, a, a few years ago, probably around five years ago, I was driving by and I saw this thing. And I went crazy and I pulled to the side of the road and I almost caused a car accident and there were many unhappy people. And I decided that I had to take a photograph of this thing because I thought for sure the municipality was going to come and spray paint over with this with like this horrible beige paint because whenever graffiti is in this particular uh, place, that's what they do. Five years later, this thing is still going strong. Still there. It's only actually through the project of working on this graffiti that led me to think about why this graffiti is still there. Do you guys know what this shows? Does anybody have an idea of what this might indicate? What? Maybe not the original. No, it's, it's rebuilt something. Mm -hmm. So some one day. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be the person who paints over the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem? <laughs> With God's personal name. Probably not me. Okay. Anyway, we'll talk about that more later. But it's really only through looking at ancient examples that I started to think about the very different functions that um, graffiti could play, actually both in the ancient and modern world. This also, this is actually very hard to photograph. It doesn't really look like it, but these are such narrow scratches on a wall that unless you use raking light, it's difficult to even get this image. Do you know what this is? Can you tell what it is? Rorschach test, I know. Bird. Bird. Yay, A plus. Bird, do you see his eye and his beak? He's much more face than he used to be, and I think there are lots of really good reasons for that. But anyway, this is a very hard photograph to come up with. We'll talk to you about it. Okay, so I set out to do a project. As I started to see it through these graffiti all over the ancient world, I started to try to figure out if I could collect as many examples as possible and sort of use them toward a different understanding of how Jews were operating in the ancient world. So I tried to do a bunch of different things. 
I tried to identify unpublished examples of graffiti, since a lot of excavators, when they saw graffiti and things like this, said, oh, these and a lot of ugly other examples like them are found in this particular place. And because I find uh, ugly more interesting for purposes of historiography, I wanted to go find the many others like them that I could find. Principally, starting in a site, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, I wanted to identify graffiti in sort of publications, things people had already looked at. And I wanted to photograph them. I wanted to collect them. I wanted to compare them to other regional examples, create a database. It's a beautiful database. It's actually not a beautiful database, but I'll show you what I tried to do with it. So that I could sort of start to develop a framework of interpretation to um, read them. But this is a really uh, collaborative venture. This is Boaz Zissou, who is at Bar Ilan uh, University. Do you know Boaz? You know? He's a lovely, lovely human and an <coughs> indefatigable spelunker. He loves <laughs> caves. Um, he actually does a lot of research on caves from the first and second Jewish revolts because a lot of people hid in caves and that sort of thing. And he's a lovely person and he was he's the type of person when he says, okay, that ladder is safe to go down into that hole poised next to the fig tree. I say, okay, if any other person told me to do that, I would not do it because I think I'm going to die, but I'll do it anyway. So I did a lot of uh, cave going with Boaz, particularly in a region called the Shvela. Um, and this is my husband. Some of you, two of you know him, right? Um, so we tried to do, so I went to as many caves as possible, and we tried to use lots of different types of technology to get information from these cave walls. And you might be saying, yeah, but I still don't care about these graffiti anyway, but I'll give you the payoff of them, I promise you. One of the things we tried to do, particularly around cave entrances, was to take um, infrared photos, because a lot of these graffiti have red paint on them. This is the exciting database. Now, aren't you glad you came? Free lunch and a screenshot of a database. This person's afternoon. But in this database, what I wanted to pay attention to was um, where graffiti were, what they looked like, and the thing that starts to emerge when you start uh, looking at graffiti is that they actually sort of have their own language, both literally and figuratively. These are social things. People would use ancient spaces, like people use modern spaces, which is that when people saw that other people were carving things on the wall, they would do the same thing. So I wanted to pay attention to who was doing what and where. Um, much of what I will show you here has to do with um, graffiti from burial caves, and often I forget that a lot of people don't hang out in burial caves a lot, and they might think it's weird. But as I said before, some of the most important evidence that we have for ancient populations actually comes from spaces where they marked their deceased. Um, here are these little pins indicating places where there are burial caves where graffiti were found inside. And um, one of these is where I spent the most time, which is in Beit Sharim National Park. It is run by the National Parks Authority, not the Antiquities Authority. And if any of you are planning a trip to Israel, you might not necessarily think of tombs as your next exciting de uh, destination. They're very, very close to modern Haifa. And in the summer, they're really cool. Like, the temperature is really cool. You go into a cave, it's much cooler. It's a very practical place to spend a lot of time. And so, theoretically, that's, that's not one of the reasons why I did it. But. This is what it looks like in the winter. Winters are rainy in this part of the world. So rainy, in fact, that to see some of these caves, the head of the park had to hire the neighboring farmer who had a lot of cows. This might resonate here. So we had to hire the, uh, the, the na well, he didn't really, she didn't really hire him, but she asked the farmer to bring his cows her cows, so the cows could eat the grasses that were about 12 feet tall in front of one of these caves to the point that we could see the snakes as we were walking over them and going into the cave, because otherwise the caves weren't, um, weren't accessible. Some of these are accessible, some of these aren't. In the summer, it's quite verdant. In the, sorry, in the winter, it's quite verdant. In the summer, it looks like this. This is an aerial view of it, and there's an archeologist at um, University of Clyde right now who's excavating the sort of living part of the city, the place where people went to live instead of uh, to die. Um, Adi Ehrlich, she's um, producing some really important finds there. There's a synagogue at Big Shattering. But, um, so this is where I'm going to show you a few images. This comes from the mandatory archive, which is not a, an archive you're compelled to see. It's an archive you're compelled to see if you do research on this period, because it comes from the period of 
uh, the British mandate in Palestine. All records from that period are kept in a particular archive in the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem. And this was one of the caves, as it was found, right, in a state of um, sort of disrepair. Uh, many of these caves were sort of, they found a lot of uh, stones from them or repaired them, sometimes in more and less obvious ways. But this is what they look like in the front. So if you could imagine, these are burial caves that are literally caves carved into the sides of hills. And they're basically a warren of, um, actually some of the caves are smaller, some of them are bigger, some of them have 125 sarcophagi in them and are huge, some of them are really small, but these are spaces where people buried their dead. Jews buried their dead, specifically Jews. In fact, this is a very famous cemetery, even in antiquity, because it was thought that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, who redacted the Mishnah, was buried there. And people think that lots of people, when they died, wanted to be buried closer to him. So that the regional elites, not international elites, but regional elites, would want to be there. And so some of the burials that we see here are products of wealthier families. Now we know, because of things like this, that Jews were buried here, and there's no real indication that non-Jews or Christians were buried here. The cemetery was probably in use from the 2nd to 6th century CE, so in a period of time where there were Christians in the area, to be sure. But the thing to remember about Beit Sharim is that only one-third of the cemetery has been excavated. So that hill, that green hill that I showed you before, those are burials. So we don't know what is the case in the hills beyond that have never been excavated. We can only sort of go by what we have excavated, and these are certainly places where Jews are buried. Any of you read Greek? Good. But anyone want to read this? I know at least one of you. <laughs> okay, so we know that many of the tombs that are here, they might not look really beautiful to our eye, but this is not graffiti, for example. These are not graffiti. These are markings of <coughs> Rabbi Gamaliel. So there are many rabbis commemorated people with the title of rabbi commemorated at Beit Sharim. This is one of them. For those of you who have studied the Mishnah Talmud, though, those, these names will be really familiar to you. But then we have other types of markings that are not epitaphs, like that one, but they could be decorative. They could be um, other forms of writing, but you'll see they're not epitaphs. This is my favorite. This is on the cover of the book. This is actually this big. You can't really tell. This is why I always tell my students that scale is very important in photographs, right? Because it seems like this is enormous, but it's actually this big. Um, it's very difficult to photograph. But it's on a corner um, from Catacomb 12. So there are different types of drawings, different types of writing. And this is a map. This is sort of the map that you get, it's a tourist map of the site in Hebrew. And the place that I want to show you first is right about here, okay? If you decide that this summer this is so inspiring and you just think burial places are the greatest thing ever and you want to go to Beit Shari in the summer, and you drive down this little road, the place you will certainly uh, go is Catacomb 20, which is sort of like used as a museum cave. And you can wander around, <coughs> there's huge sarcophagi in there, and it's where lots of people go. And typically, what would happen in this particular place is that people would go into this cave and they would see me behind this door taking pictures and making measurements and they'd say to me, why are you there? That's not the interesting part. And I'd say, thank you. <laughs> I'll follow you later. I have some things I'm doing here. And what was I doing there? Okay, so the main part here, you follow this through, and there are soaring ceilings with very, very big sarcophagi. Not necessarily so beautiful, but some of them are uh, labeled in uh, Semitic scripts. But right behind this door, which would have been opened in antiquity, were other things that I like, like these guys. You can see a lot of different features here. I'll just show you a couple. These include humans. And there's something that you might note when you see a few of these, is that their hair tends to stand straight on end, like they're electrocuted or something. A lot of them have very pronounced eyebrows. You see that too. Um, sometimes you have architectural features like this. I actually think perhaps mimics the exterior facade of the catacomb. But you also have things like this. So if you go into this cave and you were to walk in through this door, if you walked straight ahead, boom, you come on sort of this false door. It's not really a false door, it's sort of a dead end that forces you to the side. And you have this message in Greek that says, take courage, holy parents, 
Nobody is immortal. Okay. Well, it doesn't mark any tomb. There's no tomb except for a few meters away. So what's this thing doing there? And then traditionally it's sort of read as sort of this incidental type of marking. But right next to it, so if you're entering the catacomb like this, and you look forward, I showed you what you'd see. But if you looked to your upper left as you're proceeding, this is what you'd see, which is another message in Greek. And this is what it looks like on closer inspection. Sorry for the little shape shifting. It says, good luck on your resurrection. <laughs> I do think it's funny. I mean, it's hard to know how to take these things. I don't know if you've ever gotten an email where you're hoping the person was sarcastic, but you're not actually sure it could be mean instead, right? It's the same sort of thing. We have no context, really, for trying to interpret the tenor of the statement, right? Are they saying in all earnestness, good luck on your resurrection to those whose bodies are being brought inside? Or is it sort of like a little joke? We don't know. I think probably the former, to be perfectly honest. But uh, what is clear here, too, is that this is not marking a tomb. This is a public service message at the beginning of a very big catacomb that's greeting the dead as they're brought on by. Yeah? The previous one, do they know why they're talking about talking to parents? Was it uh, something about it's parents? people probably bringing their parents into the tomb deceased. Sort of like holy fathers. There's a question about it. Is it that there's something special about these people or all the dead who are brought in in that particular class of people? It's not clear. What is clear is it's not labeling the tomb of a particular person. It's sort of a broader class of people who are being um, brought inside. So these types of things are also, they also have other functions like this one, which is one of my favorite examples, because there are curses, many curses particularly written in red ochre. So these sort of respond to adjustments with different types of technology, like deep stretch technology. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And this is from a tomb in Catacomb 12. This is called an arposoleum tomb, which most of you probably use a word you mostly use in your conversation all the time. But it's a burial bed. So this is where the deceased would be sort of laid out. Does that make sense? And it's almost like a canopy. And people came and wrote above and sort of inside the tomb, two messages, one in Greek and one in Aramaic. One says nobody shall open in accordance with the holy or Roman law, sort of like two systems of law that are going to persecute or be used to prosecute the person who opens the tomb. And anyone who opens this burial, upon whomever is inside, will die an evil end. Sort of funny. It indicates that either the person knows he's buried there and doesn't want to say, or they actually don't know, and they're doing some sort of public service to um, warn off, I don't know, grave robbers, demons. Both existed in antiquity. One of the things that's greatest about this example is they really tried to hedge their bets, right? Maybe the grave robber or the demon is an Aramaic speaker. Maybe the grave robber or demon is a Greek speaker. Or the grave robber is totally illiterate, and that's why he put a robber's trench right through the back. So however they tried to hedge their bets, it didn't work. This tomb, just like pretty much every other one that's been exposed in Beit Charim, was robbed in antiquity. Which leads us to why these graffiti are so valuable, because so many of the other objects that were once found inside these catacombs, because they were reused and pillaged for so many years, all of these objects have been disinterred or stolen. Some of them still exist, but we don't really know exactly where we count they come from, which takes away a lot of the information we have about how to interpret their ancient use. Things like lamps, things like um, they're called Gunguintaria, little bottles or things like this that we think put spices or perfumes were put in to perhaps anoint the dead. But here we have in situ still these messages um, that these and a few others in the same catacomb, catacomb where we don't know the name of the person. This isn't the epitaph, but they're doing something. These messages are doing something in the space of the dead. Yeah. Do we have any indication whether those two are written by some the same person or different? I mean, is there the same time period, same handwriting? Really good question. It's really hard to know. They're both in red ochre. Curses tend to be red. Some people think that this particular material is used as an apotropaic material. You guys know that word too all the time use it in conversation, like apotropaic and arcosolia. It's just 
what you'd use in more, more conversations than that. So something apotropaic is something that turns away evil spirits. Especially when you get to this stuff, everybody likes to say it's apotropaic because when you don't know what it is, it's either religious or it's magical, right? That's sort of a default. I'm not saying that that's true, but that's sort of how it sort of shakes down. But it's really unclear. They use the same material. Most probably it's not the same person doing it. Most probably it's around the same time, but it's really unclear. We know it's ancient. Nobody uses Greek in this region today. And type of Aramaic, people could argue one or one way or another based on the paleography, but it seems to be relatively contemporaneous. And you can actually, if you go to visit now Albi, we're going to get your next flight to the region, just so you can go to these tombs this summer, you can crawl through here between uh, Catacomb 12 and Catacomb 13 if you're little. So. Okay, here's our same map. And the caves that are here, so you can even tell here, right, this one's super big. These are smaller, right? So some caves are big, some caves are small, like Goldilocks and three burial caves. Uh, on the other side, though, many of these tombs seem to be from earlier periods, and we're going to look right around at this one. Um, and this is Cave 4, or Catacomb 4, where we have a bunch of different images that we don't see in other contexts. So some look like this. See what they're holding? So these have generally been called gladiators. Why, you might ask. There's actually an elaborate theory about the person who's buried here based on these graffiti. And there are these graffiti here, and they sort of duplicate, like people copy them around the tomb. This is the, the top of the Arcosolium tomb, so if you were to imagine the tomb is here, and these are sort of on the upper left, <coughs> right where that light is. That's where they appear. And I'll tell you about the theory in a minute. These are on the opposite side. So those are on the upper left, if you're facing. These are on the lower right. And these have weapons, too. But this guy has a net. People think he's a retiarius, a certain gladiatorial type. Now, here's been the theory that people have had about this particular tomb. So above the tomb is an epitaph for somebody named um, Paul, uh, Germanus, son of Isak the Palmyrene. And people have decided that Isak, do you guys know where Palmyra is? It's in, it's in, Syria. Actually, there's a fantastic exhibit, if you guys can ever make your way to the Bent. There's a fantastic exhibit with lots of objects from Palmyra in Syria, which is one of the greatest preserved cities of uh, the ancient world until Isis demolished it just a few years ago. Um, but many Jews, including some who came from Palmyra to uh, this region, well, they were from Palmyra, came to this region, and the idea was that uh, someone named Esau was from Palmyra. He had a son. His name was Germanus, because it's a name that sounds more Roman than maybe traditionally Jewish in some way. And people theorize that because these little figures are there, it means that this son died as a gladiator in gladiatorial combat. Do you buy it? There's scary way. That's what I think, actually. Because we have these in lots of different <coughs> tombs in the region, including those in the Shvela, where you have, again, you guys are experts, this is an Arcosolium tomb again, and you have these little guys all around the tomb. Often, they're pointing their weapons toward the tomb. And I do think it's quite possible that they're there to scare people away, either literally or figuratively. Images can be pretty powerful, even if they look like something that, if you know, uh, I don't know, a five-year-old through seven-year-old, their figures might look like this. These are certainly drawn by adults and probably for a very good reason. There are other figures like this one. It's one of my favorites. He's in the same catacomb as the gladiators. Do you see the same features on this guy? He sort of has this, uh, he's sort of wearing a similar thing. Do you see the hair? The electrocuted hair and the very prominent eyebrows. He'd be very stylish today. Prominent eyebrows. And you can also see there are also these sort of quadrupeds here, some animals. And do you see other mimicking fallen figures like that? So nobody really knows what this is doing. There are lots of theories. In fact, the only other example that we have is sort of, that is sort of similar actually comes from really far afield in Paestum in Italy. And this is probably from the third through first centuries BCE. And people have understood this to be something that happens sort of to the soul after death or something like this. But it's hard to know. Another thing that we have, and I'm going to check in with you about time because I'm not sure exactly when I started. This, um, these are, sh well, you know what these are. You can do that. Ships. Now, um, 
I was at a graffiti conference at Oxford a few years ago, which I know sounds like a really rollicking good time. And one of the things that we talked about briefly was that the most popular type of graffito throughout the entire Mediterranean is the graffito of a ship. They're all over the place. They're in cliffs of Malta. They're all throughout Rome. They're through this area to be sure. But the thing is, they don't always mean the same thing just because they look sort of ship-like or shippy, right? Um, there are plenty in Malta. There are a lot in Malta areas by the sea. But Beijing isn't really close to the sea, which is part of why. Um, these actually have never been published before, but these are from Catacomb 25. And there are a lot more ships here, too. So it seems like these ships probably have something to do with their context. Maybe sort of sailing to the afterlife, some other sort of nebulous romantic idea that might overlap with Greek mythology. It's a little unclear. But these are the types of images that we see both in Jewish context and non Jewish context as well. Um, have, if any of you do go to Jerusalem anytime soon, which is sort of more accessible than Beit Sherry, and you decide to walk down Al Fasi Street, you'll be able to see the tomb from which these come. You can just walk down the street and hang out and go look through the bars and see these. These are some of the most um, famous examples of this type. These are actually made in carbon. They're depending. They're not graffiti, as you guys now know. People have traditionally interpreted this actually as a pirate ship. But you talk about that later if you really, really wanted to. But it's just another example of ships being drawn in burial places. This one actually comes from Judah, seventh, maybe eighth, seventh century. They even have sh ships there, very far inland. Okay, so the drawing of ships seems to have some sort of relationship to the burial context. But we even see these in non-Jewish <coughs> burial places, not just Jewish ones. Um, in Alexandria, a cluster of catacombs that they've been sort of getting, they've been sort of drowning in water recently, some of the um, Hellenistic and Roman period tombs in Alexandria and Egypt. These are among them, and you can sort of see, do you see that right there? There are ships. Those seem to be applied in carbon. Do you see that a little bit here? The orbs, anchor, what have you. <coughs> so they're ships. They're also little skeleton people, like this. Do you see that right there? So this guy is actually on a corner, and he's going like this. I don't know if you ever saw the Titanic movie, which is like <laughs> But uh, that's what they're sort of like, because this is actually a sharp corner. The edge has been smoothed. And on either side, you see, that's actually a hand. I know. It's really like Leonardo da Vinci. It's the same thing almost. Okay? This is a hand. This is the head of the figure. His feet look exactly the same. Do you see they're like sticks protruding from the foot? And on each side, this is a very poor photo for which I apologize. Um, do you see that? It sort of looks like an obelisk. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a <coughs> needle in New York or an obelisk that was taken to any other parts of the world, if you've been in Egypt for that matter. But this seems to be doing something else. It seems to be sort of signposting the space and marking it for the dead. Here's our old graffiti from before. Oh, it's not going to let me go back. I know it's, it just gets stuck here, so I apologize. That was that graffiti, the one who was like this before, she's inside an arcosilium too. She's sort of hovering above a tomb. And these two are some of my favorites. Uh, they are uh, one above the other in Catacomb 4 as well. And this is what they look like apart. And this is what they look like when you apply D-stretch. This is a type of software, sort of a type of technology to them. So you can see that not only was this one carved, but this one's carved and a staff is painted on it. This is how we were able to see a bunch of things that obviously you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to see otherwise without looking in the naked eye. But many of these examples that we see in Beit Shari, which were spaces that Jews used as part of their day-to-day -day lives, they buried family, they buried friends, they visited tombs, and they wrote on the walls. They changed them, they interacted with them, they left messages for people. And they did this in the same ways that a lot of their peers did. This is another example from the same catacomb in, um, in Alexandria in Egypt. And you can see, just like birds, that original bird I showed you here, there are birds there too. Okay, but there are other things that happen in graffiti. And I know our time is short. Another place where we see graffiti is not just in burial caves, but also in synagogues. In the earliest version of the church we have, the remains of which are presently at the Met, on loan. And they look like this. And some of them involve these things, which are actually prayers, forms of prayer. So we often think of graffiti in the modern world as being a type of defacement, but this is not. These are calls to be remembered in a, to them, a sacred space, 
a space where the divine was present, other worshipers were present. Instead of just sort of warning other people in this way, these people are afraid. Um, I'm going to skip to one last example. This is actually, um, these are prayer graffiti written by Jews in a sanctuary. Very aware of the class change. This is the last one I want to show. No, I want to, okay. This is the last one I want to show. Not this one, the next one. Uh, just to show sort of the broader contribution of paying attention to some of these things. So in ancient Tyre, I'm sorry, the, the words overlap here. In ancient Tyre, there was a hippodrome. I don't know if, that, if any of you have been to Italy and been to Piazza Navona. It's an old hippodrome. And people used to race, race horses here. And these were the stands. And there were different teams that people would root for. It would be like the Red Sox and the Yankees don't like each other. It would be the same thing as the greens and the blues. And all the blues, all the Yankees fans would sit in one place. All the Red Sox fans would be in the other. If you can imagine maybe getting them into the same space at all. Right? But here, from a space like this, we also have something really improbable. So this is a totally different context than the burial context I showed you before. Here is the only attestation, if we are going to assume that the presence of the menorah at this period of time is indicative of Jewish presence, this is actually a stand for a woman named Matrona, who was a purple seller. In ancient Tyre, people had the business of selling purple dye, cloth, dyed purple, this sort of thing. And people would go to the hippodrome, they'd do their shopping. It was like going to the mall while you watch the horse races. And this particular person marked her little stem on the side of the blues, and she too was selling purple with her little menorah here. What's interesting is at the same period in time where she was doing this entire, there are two things that are remarkable. One, this is a period of time where most of the writings we have from Christians entire talk about how Jews and Christians didn't like any, each other very much. In fact, when given the opportunity, Christians would go after Jews at all points in time. So it sort of calls that into question when you have somebody who puts this big menorah on their sign, it would seem sort of improbable that if that was dangerous, and you can see the little cross here, uh, that she would do that, right? It's sort of her opinion. The other thing that's really interesting about this, and maybe uh, Professor Miller can contradict me on this, uh, I believe this is the only archaeologically attested example of a Jewish woman working outside the home. So we have evidence from rabbinic texts, of course, that women worked on worked outside the home. So if men were too embarrassed to sort of sell olives, they'd send their wives to do it instead. But one, one thing that's interesting is that in people's burial monuments and things like this, Jewish women never sort of boast that they worked outside the home. So this thing, which I would sort of put under my broader rubric of graffiti, because this wasn't a formal inscription, this was sort of a sign for a place where she sold her wares, but it's sort of a fluid type of thing. It's painted, it's not hard. This is the type of thing that gives us very different insight into how people worked, <coughs> as opposed to how people visited the spaces of the dead where their loved ones were interred, or even prayed synagogues. So this is just sort of a little snapshot. And I hope there was a moment of it that you enjoyed. Right, there's where it goes. That's where it's going. And thank you so much for coming and devoting your lunch hour. So thank you very much. Um, we have a little more time if you have uh, questions. Uh, obviously whoever has to leave uh, to get to the next class can leave. Feel free to ask questions. How, <clears throat> how are these images made? Are they made in the hard rock? Are they made in a soft uh, cement that hardened later? Or what? It's a great question. And uh, it's different based on the context. So actually, we have some from Rome. The, the examples I kind of bring to you are those which are under, so they're uh, the biggest Jewish catacombs in ancient Rome are situated under Mussolini's old villa. Okay? There's a land dispute between the state who owns the villa and the people who own the surrounding land, thus making it impossible to visit these catacombs. Inside those catacombs are what I would call graffiti, but graffiti that seem to be sort of applied and swept into mortar. So that will be carved in there. Most of the examples I show you here are either carved into rock or are painted on rock. But the question about the material itself is a really important one because you'll see that if you travel through this region, there are lots of burial caves, but the ones that tend to be the most inscribed are the ones with the softest stone. 
the ones with that really hard rock, it just doesn't lend itself to it and you just don't find it there because you can't even smooth it to paint on it if you want to without very specific tools. So it's a really good question. So it's all types of media. Some are carved, some are painted, and that's what it's so That one of the woman's line purple, that's just etched in stone. That's painted and that's gone. Okay. That's gone. gone meaning? It's it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, you took what happened to it? Um, uh, well, there are many different ways to answer that question, but uh, it was it just eroded. It was unprotected. Once this, this space was excavated, um, as you probably can imagine, if you have a flat surface and then it rains for 20 years on paint and it's unprotected, it just goes. But that was, but that was painted. It was painted, and so it was visible when it was uncovered, but it's no longer. The best record we have are the records that we have are there were sort of drawings that were made in the late 70s. Um, but just, um, I know you have other questions, but one of the reasons why I really wanted to uh, complete this project is because in many parts of the world, um, this is sort of a bigger question, but there are many types of evidence for populations that people don't want to have existed there. So for example, when I did work in Tunisia, there are catacombs in Tunisia which are totally, un they're actually within a French military cemetery. They're down, they, they sort of are carved, the, the military cemetery goes over the ancient Jewish remains, and there are carvings at the entrance, but they're totally unprotected, right? So acid, rain, whatever, it erodes the side, and eventually they will be gone, and that's exactly what everybody who lives there would like to have. So part of the reason why I wanted to do this and sort of document whatever I could, even at this stage, because there's more to be done, is partly because of that. Because it's very important to me that if you're trying to assess the history of Jews throughout the Mediterranean, that you document whatever you can before a lot of it just disappears. Um, but in that particular case, it wasn't necessarily malice or deliberate malice. It was just, you know, it was left out in the open. It's gone. Yeah. So you put that all of these. Um, is there, are there certain formal properties that these um, graffiti have? Like, uh, I mean, the material imposes certain limitations, like straight line is easier than a curved line, but are there uh, style features that are shared by the uh, graffiti you've seen, let's say, in comparison with graffiti in other places of the world? Um, well, I think it's a really important question. I think every place sort of has its own graffiti language. I know it sounds sort of weird, but graffiti in certain parts of Syria look a little bit different than the graffiti you see here, and, and partly that has to do with medium and location, and when you have them preserved, let's say, in plaster, it's sort of not attractive, but still somewhat easier to carve into than some of the rock. So it's really hard to, this is why, I mean, Really, there's no true single definition of it that responds to stylistic criteria because it's just a really broad rubric. It's basically anything that's not monumental or officially imposed, but there are lots of ways you could critique it. But it's just sort of a way to notice materials that indicate how people use space in antiquity. Like if you're just walking through and you just wrote on the wall, that actually tells us something about how people were using or in the Dori Europa synagogue, the fact that most of the graffiti surround the doorways in the synagogue as opposed to the shrines of pagan structures or the baptistry in the church actually might say something about the spatiality of the synagogue. That is, actually, maybe if you're putting similar prayers in the doorways that other people are in their shrines, that maybe there's something particularly important about the doorway in that context. So it gives us, when, when you just sort of alter the criteria for context, not to be too loosey-goosey about it, but you sort of have to respond to each individual region. It just gives us different information. But there's no sort of formal. The big book of graffiti in 2001, Martin Longner um, published this massive catalog of graffiti that was all sort of figural graffiti, and it's amazing. But it's all stylistically organized. So all the ships are with the ships. All the people going like this are with the people going like this. But it doesn't tell us anything about context, right? So one of the reasons why people said that those were gladiator graffiti, for example, is because they look like some of the graffiti around in Pompeii, like where gladiators were to have fought, but that's not an arena, right? So anyway, so so some people have sort of posited those types of criteria. I don't do it here because what I'm dealing with is sort of too diffuse. Yeah. Sorry, that's a very long answer. 
answer. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, you were talking about how much information about Jews in the ancient world has been lost. Um, every once in a while in history, you know, we think something was lost and something gets discovered. Is there anything that's happened, you know, in recent or even not so recent history in this area that makes you think there might be some revelations, you know, that will give us more information about the time? Sure. I mean, I think it's a great question, and I think uh, Professor Miller might want to contribute his own in this regard, but I think that um, every time something is discovered, whether it's, you know, excavations around the old city in Jerusalem and they find this sort of like these Byzantine medallions with a huge menorah on them, or most notably, very recently, um, Professor Jody Magnus, who's at UNC Chapel Hill, has been excavating the synagogue in Hukuk, which is along the Galilee, and the mosaics that she has uncovered there were, are just sort of unthinkable. I mean, they've by looking at those mosaics in conjunction with other finds from the region, people are starting to think really more meaningfully about sort of local Jewish traditions in different parts of the ancient world, specifically in Roman Palestine, the role of Samson and sort of oral legend in ways that are otherwise documented. And I remember talking to her just before she started the dig in, I guess it was 2010 or 2011. And her dig is now sponsored by National Geographic because part of what they have uncovered is so remarkable. They think that some of the mosaics might be the only documented uh, mosaics that depict a non-biblical scene on a synagogue floor. There are many debates about that, but they're remarkable. I mean, they're really, really remarkable to the point that we were both speaking at the same conference on the synagogue in Roman Palestine. And she was showing her slides, and I was like, here are my amulets. You know, it was very, I was like, this really is embarrassing. I mean, they, they're amazing. So, and she never anticipated that that would happen. So in terms of um, finds yet to be discovered, absolutely. There are Aramaic documents from Bactria. I mean, things, things are always happening. Um, and I do think that um, as people continue to excavate, particularly in Israel, there's a lot there's a lot that we probably have yet to see and will see that's really exciting and can really instantly change our understandings of sort of the dynamics of Jewish life in different parts of the ancient world. It's exciting. If it, I would encourage you, you'll be like, oh, that really looks even more ridiculous now. But I encourage you to, just for an example, to look up under, it's H-U-Q-O-Q, -Q, the mosaics that were discovered in the synagogue. But it's just one example. It's sort of like a case study. I mean, part of the problem is that on the one hand, there are more studies in certain places, while on the other hand, um, there's a reticence to uncover anything that relates to Jewish populations in other parts of the world. And so um, part of why I think this is important is you sort of build a database as quickly as you can, even though in other places a lot of things are lost. So when I was in Tunisia, I was told um, when I was looking at the collections there, somebody said, oh, don't tell anybody. Sorry, obviously, my word is really good here. But it was like, don't tell anybody, but whenever the people who work in the museum see these lamps with the menorah on them, they just smash them under their foot. Right? So there are ways in which, and this is not to vilify Tunisia in any way because I really valued my time there, but I'm just saying that it's sort of, we're, we're fighting uh, erosion, we're fighting development, right? There are places where people sort of build things quickly and then we don't have the information. So on the one hand, there's sort of a race to recover before it's lost, but on the other hand, great things are being found by the day, so. All right, let's thank Dr.